listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. We love y'all. I, I was I was starting to say something first service, and I don't have, I don't actually think I finished my statement. But I'm in. Uh, uh, how many of y'all use U version as a reading app, like on your phones? I've been using that since like 2011, I think. And I've uh, I'm going through two plans right now. I've got like 25 days left, and one of the plans is um, Psalms and Proverbs. And somehow, I ended up on Proverbs 31 today on Mother's Day. I thought that was interesting because I had not intentionally done that. But I love you, Version. If you all have a hard time staying in the Word daily, um, I would highly, highly recommend a reading plan. Um, The app is free. I I have, oh, we still need a rose here. Um, I have averaged uh, going through the Bible one and a half times since like 2011 a year. And, uh, and that app just keep, you know, it'll give you notifications and it's really good for your reading time. It's better than that, people. You should be excited about the word of God. Man, tough crowd this morning. Well... Out of curiosity, who's noticed a uptick in their dream life in a good way, like good dreams, not just warfare? Yeah. Right around, somewhere around three weeks ago, is there, there was a shift. I woke up in the middle of the night from, the dream, from a dream, and I felt like the Lord said that there was breakthrough because... I don't know about y'all, I was having lots of warfare dreams there for a while. I had a very interesting uh, dream last night coming into this morning. Um, I was being given a tour by someone with me. I couldn't see their face and uh, of the Guadalupe River. And we're walking down the, you know, the... I don't want to say the shore, but whatever. We're going down the side of the river. And there was a big um, a big river or ocean port. Like a, it, it, I knew it was the ocean. And it was coming into the Guadalupe. And I thought, man, that's interesting. Uh, I was like, this would be an awesome place to go fishing. Right? So... Obviously, the ocean does not come into the Guadalupe and Kerrville, in case you're wondering geographically. That would be a really long run for the ocean. But, um, but what I do believe it means is that there is a gate for the nations to come to Kerrville. And um, for, I don't know, maybe 15 years, probably 15 years ago, somewhere around there, the Lord began to speak to me about this region. And I knew it was called to be like a modern day Antioch or an apostolic hub. I knew it would be a safe place in the last days. And, but that people would come in, they would get equipped, they would go out. And, uh, and I, I, through a series of night visions and different things, I knew, uh, a small piece of what the Lord wanted to do. But fishing has to do with evangelism, right? And the ocean or the seas, if you look at scripture, that that represents the nations or masses of people. This is biblical language. Go look at your scripture and and you'll see. Um, I was talking with Sean earlier and he, he just said he felt like this real significant... In Daniel... Um, whatever a watcher decreed, it could not be changed. And it said it came by the decree of the watchers. And we were talking earlier, and um, I would say that 
there's been some things decided or decreed in, in the last couple of months concerning the body of Christ and concerning um, our country. And I think that regardless of what happens um, in, the, in the coming months, that we are in the beginnings of seeing very significant things happening in a positive light in the body of Christ. I do believe that you're going to continue to see a a dividing of of sheep and goats. You're going to continue to see leaders in the body of Christ exposed um, that refuse to repent. You're going to continue to see leaders in other spheres of influence get exposed. Um, You know, the justice of God can only lay bare in the streets for so long before regardless of how good or how lawless we are as a nation or a people, he begins to act for his namesake. And I I would say that as a nation, we don't necessarily deserve anything but judgment. But I also know that God is slow to anger and that he doesn't take delight in things being destroyed. Even, Even in the old covenant, he said, do I take delight in the destruction of the wicked? No, I'd rather they repent. And so we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. And, you know, it's, it's, we're going to get lots of opportunities in the days ahead to actually love like Jesus. And you're going to find out where you've been loving out of your soul versus your spirit. In case you hadn't figured it out yet, the level of love that God calls us to cannot be accomplished in our souls because it's supernatural. So if you walk in the flesh, you don't love like Jesus, period. It says that the love of many will grow cold in the last days. And I've said this before, but I think that when we're in a season or a a time of an antichrist spirit, it's increasing. It's exactly what's attacked Israel. It's what's been unleashed over our nation. It's the spirit that is behind uh, all of the pro-Palestinian protests that are not peaceful. It's an antichrist spirit. It's lawlessness you don't need a dream vision or an angelic visitation to realize that God said these things would happen. Right? Now, what is our response going to be? Is it going to be, let's call fire down from heaven? I see some of you smiling. That makes me very nervous people. Yes, yes, let's do that. No, Jesus said, Peter, you don't know what spirit you're of. You know, when Saul had his conversion, everyone was scared to death of him. Right? They didn't believe he was, he, that he legitimately was uh, converted. I want, I want to tell you that I think we're going to see some significant Saul's coming to know the Lord in the days ahead. Last night, I found myself in one of those spaces. Seriously, I got the same exact time as I had for service. How'd that happen? Um, not knowing what I wanted to, what, what the Lord wanted to teach on. And I asked my family to pray, and they didn't say anything to me. Le- actually, Lisa said, I, she goes, well, I have an idea, but I don't think you want to hear it. Not true, babe, not true. Anyways, so with the, uh, with the remaining time we have this morning or this afternoon, um, I want to talk to you about ministering to the Lord. Um, I've only talked about this one other time, I think, uh, since the church plant. And 
if, if we don't get this, if this is not the foundation of everything in our lives, then you're, at best you're going to burn out. It's not that bad already, is it? You're, you're, you're going to end up becoming a professional Christian without it. That means you learn the talk, you learn the lingo, you're a chameleon, you can, you can look like everything's great, and it's not. The definition, or the Hebrew word, is uh, sharath, and it means to attend as a, a menial or worshiper. Figuratively, to contribute. It means to minister, serve, or wait on. And I don't know about y'all, but when it comes to like Psalms 46, 10, be still. Is that on the front of your journal? Awesome. Be still and know that I am God. See, the Lord's always talking and he's always wanting to talk. He just doesn't always want to talk about what you want him to. Did you figure that out yet? Yeah. And, and when you think you've come to him with a crisis, he doesn't always think it's a crisis. Did you ever figure that one out too? Lord, we're out of time. Two weeks later, Lord, we're out of time. A month later, Lord, why haven't you answered this? Do you not care? Do you not see the anguish I'm in? He's like, yeah, and it's working. (laughs) Hmm. What does it mean for us to minister, to serve, to wait on the Lord? Because that is absolutely the key to you actually abiding in love and joy and peace. It's the key for you to have peace when everyone else is losing it. It says, let the peace of Christ rule and reign. That means in any given circumstance, no matter what's going on in your life, you can let his peace rule rule over your mind and heart. Jesus was not pretending to be asleep in the boat, y'all. And that storm had professional fishermen scared to death, convinced, do you not care? We're going to perish, Lord. He's like, why'd you wake me up from my nap? He literally was sleeping in the storm. How big of a storm can you sleep in? What will determine that is the depth of your intimacy with him. In case you hadn't figured it out yet, another caveat, trust is built by time. The more time we spend with someone, the more trust we build. Or at least it's supposed to work that way, right? Luke seven thirty seven to 50. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. I told first service, Lisa was making fun of my toes last night. I was like, you know what? She probably won't be anointing my feet or her washing them or kissing my feet anytime soon. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him for she's a sinner. Make it modern day. How many of you would feel comfortable walking into most churches? 
See, the one thing that I count as the biggest honor is that anyone from any walk of life, no matter what they've gone through, can walk into this house and feel family. But the religious doesn't like that. They want to judge everything. But they don't want to be judged. Don't judge me. I know. Can I get an interpretation for that? And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered correctly this time. The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. Remember in scripture, it says, greet each other with a holy kiss. That's the not really in our culture today, you know what I'm saying? But, yep, moving on. And he says, you gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who are at the table with him begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I want to tell you one of the dangers of walking with Jesus for a long period of time is we can actually forget what we've been saved from. We, we can begin to puff up and forget what we were pulled out of. And if we're not careful, we can actually find ourselves judging people and the very sin that used to entangle us. And it's a slow burn. It happens because we lose the posture at being at his feet and not caring who's in the room. Because when that woman walked into the room, guess what? She wasn't worried about how many Pharisees were there, how many Sadducees were there, how many scribes were there, uh, how many popular people were there, how many gifted people were there. She wasn't worried about any of that because her eyes were focused on Jesus. And she went in and began to minister with her tears to the Lord. You know, it says every tear we've ever cried is in a bottle. If you all look back there, um, Deanna's got that picture and there's like a, a water, a puddle of tears in front of her. She actually painted that of herself and there's a little bottle in there and it says redeemed. See, there's, there's honestly even a place of intercession where your tears become ministry. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Do we know how much we've been forgiven of? Or do we judge our sin? Do we compare each other? Compare my sin that I was forgiven of to your sin? It says when we compare each other or compare one another that we're not wise. Jesus is our standard. He's the standard of holiness. Just because you may be Walking a little bit better than someone next to you means nothing. It means there's an opportunity to potentially maybe help them get out of the ditch. You who are spiritual, go and restore such a one. But take heed lest you too be tempted. Are you all with me?
Luke 10, 27. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. We, we see a love in the Acts of the Apostles in the book of Acts that I think is very rare. I think that we're in many ways trying to get back there. You know, we, we talk about, you know, and greater things than this we will do because he returned to the Father. And I think in many ways that the truth is we need to just get back to or get to a place of living the life that he lived rather than visiting power, rather than visiting miracles. We actually live a life of intimacy where those things are constantly following us as a stamp from heaven because we're leading with the gospel of the kingdom. See, you're seeing the celebrity Christian torn down right now. You're seeing leaders in the body of Christ who refuse to repent and were full of spiritual abuse and the Lord has said, I'm done. They're just like the the pastors in Jeremiah where he rebuked those shepherds. We've got to get back into a place where being at his feet is the focal point. That nothing, no matter, listen y'all, even when we come together corporately on Sunday morning, what is the motivation? What is the, what is, when you come in, what is the number one thing that you're looking forward to? If it's to see each other, your, your motives are wrong. Not that that's a bad thing. But it should be Jesus. In Acts 13, it says there were prophets and teachers and they were gathered gathered together and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Notice what was going on when the call came. They were in a place of fasting and prayer and ministering to the Lord and then the Holy Spirit spoke. They weren't petitioning him to speak a certain word or they weren't looking for him to do a specific thing, but in the midst of being aligned in intimacy with him, a call came. You know, Lisa, years ago, Lisa looked at me. She goes, what are you waiting for? Like an angelic visitation before you start going after this? And I looked at her and I said, well, maybe. That's where my mindset was. Yeah, that wouldn't hurt. An angel come, wham! And um, and it and it was actually Rich that kind of encouraged me way back when to start taking steps of faith. And you know what was interesting? It was when I actually started moving forward by faith towards the things that I had, uh, you know, I, I knew clear enough to go towards. It was in the going that all of a sudden all these other things began to happen. I did have an angelic visitation. I did have visions. I did have dreams. And revelation was released, but it was released as I was going. Listen, the law of promotion in Scripture is what you steward will grow. So some of you, if you're sitting around waiting for an angelic visitation, stop it. Take the revelation you got from the Lord and begin to walk forward. Are you with me? You may never get an angelic visitation. Last time I checked, you can't order those. You don't pull up to the drive-thru of heaven. Hey, I'm at St. Arbucks. I need... (laughs) See, that was a decent dad joke. 
Only when I get under the anointing, the jokes get better. You know what I mean? I'm trying, folks. I'll keep going. I don't want to crash after that one. If if you look at script, if you look at the the whole canon of scripture, it was the men of God that kept ministering unto the Lord as their priority that seemed to be used in significant ways. Samuel, his his mother couldn't couldn't get uh, couldn't have a child, and she shows up. They're doing their yearly sacrifice and. She's over there in anguish, murmuring and all this. And Eli, at this point, is so dull. He's like, woman, put your alcohol. You know, he thinks she's drunk. And of course, she was not drunk. She was in anguish over the fact that she was barren. She goes, no, sir, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I've not been drinking. And she explains everything. And he goes, well, may the Lord grant you a child. And guess what? Samuel shows up. It says, as soon as Samuel was weaned, she lent him to the Lord. And so Samuel grows up. So in, in case you were wondering, when, when being weaned as a child back then, it wasn't like a year old or a year and a half old because they didn't drive down to Walmart and grab some baby formula and put a bottle in their mouth. So the breastfeeding process lasted a lot longer. They say that Samuel was roughly five years of age when the word of the Lord was revealed to him. But he grew up. He, it, she would bring a change of clothes every single year when she'd go up. And he grew up in the house of the Lord, ministering to the Lord. Listen, your number one job, regardless of what you do, whether you're a school teacher or a police officer, an attorney, whatever it is, your number one thing to do is to minister to the Lord, to wait on the Lord. Some of y'all are in a divine frustration and you don't know it because you've been ministering more to yourself than the Lord and he's not blessing it and you think somehow he's against you. First Samuel two eighteen and nineteen. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. I was just looking at pictures, Micah. He was so little. Everybody's like, "What happened to your son? He's huge." In fact, I saw I ran into a teacher yesterday at HEB, and she's like, "Man, Micah's gotten huge." And uh, she made a joke about my boys looking down on me now. And um, I'm like, I resemble that. And I worked really hard, y'all, to hit six foot tall. I mean, like I was trying to will it when I was a kid. Uh, My whole goal, I kid you not, honest truth, my whole goal was to get to to hit six foot tall. I just missed it. I mean, so frustrating. I mean, just so close platform shoes. Cole, can I borrow those platform shoes? But you understand something that Samuel, apart from Jesus, Samuel was literally the only prophet that said none of the words that he spoke fell to the ground. What does that mean? He's a whole lot better than the American prophets, (laughs) especially the ones that refuse to repent. That's another teaching. But none of the words that he spoke fell to the ground. And I love this because I, from t- you know, teaching in the prophetic and equipping in the prophetic, I get naysayers every once in a while, believe it or not. And even people that say, oh, it's not biblical to train people to, to prophesy. Really? Go to 1 Samuel. He's ministering to the Lord and it says, and the word of the Lord was revealed to him. It said had had not yet been revealed to him. So in the middle of the night, Samuel, roughly five years old, hears this voice, calls his name. Samuel goes to Eli and says, Eli, what do you want? He goes, I didn't call you. Y'all, if God's voice did not sound like Eli in that moment, Samuel would have gone over there be like, Eli, somebody's in my room. 
No, he heard Eli's voice, but it was actually the Lord calling him. And Eli was a little dull at this point. And this takes place three different times. Finally, he recognizes that the Lord is calling him. And after, and he goes, if you hear it again, say, speak for your servant is listening. What was that? Oh, my word. Eli just mentored Samuel in hearing the voice of the Lord. This is, this is why you have Jericho and Gilgal and Jordan and Bethel. These were all the schools of the prophets where the sons of the prophets were, where Elijah visited before he was taken up. And every one of these locations, they said, do you know your ser- uh, the Lord's going to take your master today? And Elisha was like, yes, I know. Shut up. Paraphrase. But he knew he was going to be taken. And do you understand in that moment, there was a test from the Lord? You know, we're constantly being tested for promotion. And I want to say that how you handle adversity is one of the greatest tests that will determine how much responsibility you're going to be able to carry in the kingdom. Listen, offenses will come. I guarantee you, if you spend enough time with anybody in this room, they're going to irritate you. No, for real. It's going to happen. How fast we forgive actually tells you how mature you are. See, there's people out there that will tell you that forgiveness needs to be drawn out and take a long time. You need to flog yourself to prove your forgiveness. That's nothing more than secular humanism. Forgiveness 470 times in a day. Forgive, 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 or 490. The point is we forgive We forgive, we forgive, and you forgive to the degree that you want to be forgiven because if you don't forgive, neither are you forgiven. I think one of the greatest things that we can do is actually see Christ in each of us because every one of you are made in his image, right? Peter, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? Feed my lambs. Do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep. Do you love me more than these? Tend my sheep. There are so many things fighting for the affections of our heart today. Did you know even because of algorithms, when you get on social media, if you start looking at something, some of y'all think it's prophetic. Oh, man, I can't believe how all, look at all of a sudden all these videos are coming up. Yes, people, it's called an algorithm. They're feeding you what you want to see. (sighs) Lisa gets, when when I hit a, crescendoing of fatigue. I like mindless entertainment. That entertainment consists of YouTube. Two major things, well, two major things, and she's rolling her eyes right now, y'all. I love watching uh, strongmen, like the contest where they pick up the, are y'all with me? You know, they're taking those circus dumbbells and benching them and deadlifting a thousand. I I love, I've I've lifted weights, not that you can tell, but I've lifted (laughs) for decades and uh, and I I really enjoy lifting. And way, 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 way back, I even did two bodybuilding shows in late high school. Yeah, I know. Yep. (laughs) Now it's, now it's body by donuts. Um, anyways, but I will just totally check out and I'll watch that or, um, food eating contests. And so 
Last night I was watching a food eating con- Lisa was like, if I have to watch one more weightlifter or one more skinny man eating 10 pounds of food, she goes, I'm done. I'm done. That, that's what I, that, this is where we're at, people. I apologize. But Romans 12 says, I, uh, this is the amplified. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Y'all, even according to Hebrews 1.14, the angels are called ministering spirits. It says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Paul told the Corinthians, do you not know that Christ is in you? Do you not? He rebuked them. He says, you're acting as mere men. Do you not know you'll, that you'll judge angels? What is wrestling for the affection of your heart today? And if he says, do you love me more than these? What have you you been using as a fleshly pacifier instead of coming to the Holy Spirit for comfort? And when you walk into a room, are you looking for Jesus? Are you looking for the accolades of men? Are you looking for the praises of men? Proverbs says everyone will praise you when you do well. But it's a slippery slope. Because of that, if you live for that identity, the moment they're not pleased with you, you'll die. Wayne, can I get you to... Y'all, there's when we are really walking in intimacy with the Lord, no one sees. It is the secret place. Your prayer life is built in the secret place. No one's there. There's no social media. You unmuted, Sean. He, Sean was sleeping. It's okay. It's the intimacy that is cultivated in the secret place that is going to allow you in the days ahead to stand. It's the intimacy with him that's going to be a shield over your heart from the fear in the coming days. It says that men's hearts will fail them for fear. Y'all, if you turn the news on, it's not really encouraging right now, is it? Like there's nothing encouraging about any of the news right now. Not that there has been in decades, but... All we, all we see is a culture that has lost their minds. It's like Looney Tunes, like we saw on the, or uh, Porky the Pig. <laughs> Do you not know that Christ is in you? There's, there's never been a time now more than
more than ever, you have the answer. But the question is, have you allowed other things to get in the way of being at his feet? The average pastor spends 15 minutes a day in prayer. Yeah, wow. 90% of the body of Christ will never share their faith. And the 10% that does has not for six months on average. Y'all, there are simple things that have to change in us. And I want to tell you that they would change if we would actually be at his feet and make that a priority. We, We wouldn't have to check off the boxes. We wouldn't have to suffer through prayer when it became our delight. I just want to encourage y'all to remember what the Lord has saved you from. To much is to whom much is forgiven, they love much. And I, I, always, I think it's I think it's a great opportunity for us to examine our lives and say, Lord, what am I loving more than you? Because we've all done it, y'all. I'm not throwing, I'm throwing, if I was throwing stones, it would be in a glass house and be broke. (laughs) But we're, every one of you, look around. You're going to spend all of eternity with each other. Whether you like it or not. It's true. We're going to spend all of eternity together. Could you imagine what it's going to be like when billions of people are gathered in oneness to, with an innumerable number of angels worshiping the creator of the universe? If you're, listen, I, I am an introverted extrovert. I recharge alone but I, I, I like being around people. I just can't recharge with you. Does that make sense? But we're, we're going to be around each other for eternity. Billions of people, y'all. So if you don't like being around a lot of people, get over it. Because God's into mega church. He is. Peter preaches 3,000 people came to know the Lord in one day. Suck it up, buttercup. Learn how to love. Bob Jones died in the 70s. He stood before Jesus and he asked him one thing. Did you learn to love? And that is the greatest test for every single one of us on planet earth. Have we really learned to love or do we only love the ones that we see ourselves inside of? Because that is the ingredients for clicks. And then schisms and discord and all sorts of fleshly garbage. Let's stand. The prayer team would come forward, please. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.